I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Boy, I was really hoping to get through all of this last week. It just wasn't going to happen, right? And so instead of rushing it, I wanted to go ahead and split that up. And so if you look in your bulletin, uh, this week we have the bulletin insert. Um, I had so many people say, where was it last week? You know what? It got missed, okay? They did not have bulletin inserts at the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> they didn't even have bulletins that I know of. Maybe they did. I'm, I've never seen one. But what, what I did was um, the point at where we stopped from the beginning to there, you'll see that I actually filled those answers in. Right, so that you have them, okay? Uh, they're, they're in bold leathers there on, on your insert. And so uh, I just want to review a little bit and then uh, we'll get into the rest of the message. Uh, we talked about last week uh, how do we handle tough portions of Scripture? How do we handle those tough texts that we just don't understand and we just don't get, right? And uh, this portion here in 1 Peter chapter 3, many of the commentators will say, this is one of the more difficult passages of Scripture, okay, to, to really be able to sink your teeth into. There are some other ones. If you look into the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39, mind-blowing. There's a lot there. This will apply, these, these principles, as you look into the book of Ezekiel. The book of Revelation, for example, is another one. How many people here understand the book of Revelation? Okay, are you ready for this? You're not going to have a great understanding of Revelation until you have a great understanding of Ezekiel and Daniel. So you got to start there before you come here. Okay, so now, how many people really have a great understanding of Revelation? Everybody sitting on their hands. Okay. Here's what I'm getting at. There are some scriptures that are, that are just very cut and dried and very easy to understand. You know, one of the most simple ones is this, for God so loved the world that he gave. You know, I love that verse. That's a great verse, and, and we can look at that and we can go, woohoo, this is great stuff. And that is something that right away we can see the love of God and we can see how that was made known. Then you come to other portions of scripture, uh, uh, really, they're just plain tough. They are tough to research. They are tough to kind of wrap your arms around. And as a pastor, one of the things that I, I absolutely love is, is the preaching where you start in verse 1 and you go all the way to the end of the book. And so you don't miss anything. So you don't miss these difficult texts. And when I saw this, I went, oh, we're going to have to tackle this. Uh, we, we can't skip it. And so we utilize these, uh, uh, these steps in handling tough texts. Uh, the first one is this. Don't become so obsessed with the details that we miss the main point. We talked about the importance of looking at broad picture, right? And it's so easy to get uh, bogged down in so many of the details that we forget what those details are pointing to. And so we want to make sure that we keep the main point always in mind. And we let the details define what the main point is. Okay? So we need to make sure that we keep the main point always in mind. Secondly, uh, we need to make sure that Scripture interprets Scripture. Okay? This isn't what I say. You know, this isn't what Pastor Harold says. And yes, I did rack his brain on a few of these over the last couple of weeks going, what do you think about this? And you know what he'd do? He would just kind of smile and laugh. He laughs at me a lot. I'm used to that. Okay. It's not what Pastor Harold thinks or Pastor Scott or me. It's what God's word says, right? And so when we are looking at scripture, we need to let scripture interpret scripture. And we're going to see an example of this uh, here a little bit later on, the importance of knowing what God's word says so that we can interpret scripture. Thirdly, leave room for some mystery. You know what? We don't know at all, do we? I am firmly convinced that this side of glory, we will never know all of the mysteries 
that we find in God's word. There's no way we can possibly know that. And I'm also convinced that once we get to the glories of heaven, uh, we will be in the presence of God, and we can rest assured then, just as we can now, that God knows his word, right? It's okay to say, I don't get this, right? Have you ever had a teacher that said, I don't know? Okay, this pastor, you're going to hear sometimes say, I don't know, okay? Mystery is okay. There are some things that we are not going to understand. That's where faith comes in, okay? So that's all right. Do not be overly dogmatic about the conclusions that we reach. You know what? Um, it is not always my way or the highway, is it? Now, there are some things that it really is, okay? Try to put broccoli on my plate. Okay. But when it comes to scripture, and you've heard Pastor Harold do this, you've heard Pastor Scott do this, you've heard me do this, we will come to a portion of scripture and we will say, well, there are several interpretations and they are this. You know, you have this one, you have this one, you have this one. And then we'll, we will say, I kind of tend toward this one and here's why. Okay. Okay. Um, that's okay. Do not be overly dogmatic about your conclusions. Is it okay to be wrong sometimes? Am I ever wrong? I heard my wife say yes, and she's working today. It's okay, right? Um, there will be differing interpretations on some things. Here's the, here's the point here. There are some things that we can be very dogmatic about. For example, uh, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. That's not open to interpretation. Okay? It's just not. Uh, did Adam have a belly button? That's open to interpretation. And Susie just took the words right out of my mouth. Susie? Who cares? Exactly. Okay? So these are the four points that we use when we are not only looking at the difficult texts, but very often uh, we will use these just as we're even looking at the simple texts, like John 3.16, okay? Uh, Romans 3.23, wherever we find ourselves, these are some of the tools that we need to use. So I want us to uh, start in verse 18, and uh, we'll read uh, through verse 22, and then just a little bit of review as we finish things up. Uh, for Christ also suffered once for sins, that's important. The righteous for the unrighteous, that's huge. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. Uh, we talked about several things here. We talked about uh, the key facts of Jesus' suffering. And we see this in verse 18. Jesus suffered once. Unlike the Old Testament, sacrifices were given over and over again, weren't they? Over and over again. Uh, Jesus suffered once. He died once. Once was enough. Jesus suffered for sin. He suffered for my sin, not his sin. Jesus, the sinless son of God, no sin found in him. He didn't have to suffer for himself. He did that for you and for me. He suffered for sins. Jesus took my place, you will see here, where he says in verse 18, the righteous for the unrighteous. 
He took our place. He took my place. I deserved judgment and death. Jesus took my place. The purpose is found there as well. The purpose was to bring me to God so that we could be introduced to God himself. That is the purpose. And this was all accomplished by being put to death in the flesh and throughout Scripture, within the New Testament, with the, uh, the books that Paul wrote, the books that Peter wrote over and over again, we see the, uh, the illustration of going from being dead to being alive. Okay? That's backwards, isn't it? We're alive. Okay? One day, we won't be, uh, to be perfectly honest about it, unless Christ comes back. And here, Scripture's turning this around totally. You know, everybody knows that you're, we're alive and then we, we die. We see that in, in the book of Hebrews, even. But the illustration is this. We go from death to life. That is where the real miracle is. And this all happens because of what we see here in verse 18. Jesus suffered once. He suffered for sin. He took my place so that we could have a relationship with God and we could know him in a very personal way. It was all accomplished by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. And so from the world's perspective, it seems like Jesus lost and the world won. That couldn't be further from the truth. That's what resurrection is all about, right? Right? That's what resurrection is all about. Okay? Uh, the grave could not hold him. And therein is the victory. We talked about uh, uh, Jesus proved his triumph through his resurrection and his ascension. Uh, Jesus proclaimed his triumph. We talked about the difference in scripture between the word spirit. Large S versus small S. Okay? Whenever you see large S in scripture, that is reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay? When you see small s, that would be our makeup. That would be, that would be us. It makes reference to the human spirit. There were some questions that we talked about that needed to be answered. The first one, to whom did Jesus make the proclamation here in these verses? What exactly did he proclaim? When did he proclaim it? Uh, we did talk about who did Jesus make this proclamation to? It was made to the prisoners. We see that in um, uh, verse uh, 18. Is it 18? Let me see. Da, 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 da. Uh, verse 19. Uh, it was made to the prisoners, to the spirits that were in prison. We talked about several of the clues that we find here in Scripture. Uh, who was this? Uh, fallen angels is what it appears to be referencing. And we looked at the life of Noah. And we talked about what Noah had gone through, and you'll recall uh, how many righteous people were there on the face of the earth? Eight. Okay? It says that right here in, in this passage of Scripture. There were eight people. The entire world, there were eight righteous people. Wow, think about that for a minute. The enormity of that. Who were the prisoners? We know that Noah had tremendous wickedness that he dealt with in the world. 
And it has been proposed that much of that wickedness came about from fallen angels and demonic spirits that were present in the world. Do we have them today? Certainly we do. Do you think times were different in the days of Noah? Uh, no, they weren't. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, preserved Noah, says that he was a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Jude, uh, verse 6, the angels did not stay within their own position of authority, left their proper dwelling. He has kept them in eternal chains. So who are they? These are the fallen angels who have been imprisoned and they are awaiting their final judgment. Okay, there will be payday someday. Can I say that? That's not just for us, but for the fallen angels as well. What did he proclaim to these spirits? What did he proclaim? Well, um, I think we can eliminate one possibility and that possibility is this. There are some that would say Jesus went there to proclaim the gospel to them. Okay, This is where it becomes very important that we let scripture interpret scripture. Does it say anywhere in scripture that once we die, that we get a second chance at accepting Jesus Christ? Does it say that anywhere? Okay. Scripture does not say that. Doesn't say that at all. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that, the judgment. Okay? There are some religious systems that believe very differently, aren't there? Okay? I think of Roman Catholicism, for example. Um, they have... The concept of purgatory, which you don't find in scripture anywhere, by the way, um, it's not there. Purgatory says that um, when I die, I go to this holding place, and if my family says enough prayers and gives enough money to the church, that that will be added to my account, and I might make it to heaven someday. Where's the hope in that? There is none. There is none. But yet you have religious systems that will teach that and will preach that. Can I say they will get rich off of that? Think about that for a moment. Nowhere in scripture do we see this at all. If you take away purgatory, really Roman Catholicism pretty much falls apart because their hope of heaven is dashed. Doesn't matter how righteous you are, if your debt hasn't been paid, you're not going there. There was one priest in an article that I read who wrote, I'm a priest and I did all of these studies and I've done this and I've done that I hope I'm good enough. That should, that should sadden us, that should grieve us when we stop to consider that those systems are out there and that there are people that honestly think that when you die, you get a second chance at the gospel. Friends, we just don't see that anywhere we don't find it. Scripture interprets scripture. You can look high and low and you will never find that. So if he's not proclaiming the gospel, what is he proclaiming? We're gonna see that next week. We'll look at another verse that refers to the preaching of the gospel and in that verse, the verb it's really the basis for the word evangelism, but here in verse 19, it's a different word. 
And the word is this, it's to announce a triumph. Very different, isn't it? When you do the word studies, it makes it very clear. He is making a proclamation or announcing a triumph. So what was it that he proclaimed? Well, triumph would look like this. His victory over sin, death, hell, demons, and Satan himself. Uh, There was a great victory that happened when Christ died for us. That was the proclamation. From the very moment they rebelled against God, Satan and his demons had been seeking to destroy the works of Jesus. They couldn't do it. And so now the one that they had been seeking to destroy, here he is saying, here I am. Now that should be enough to give you goosebumps. To me, that is absolutely huge. Jesus hung on the cross, bore the sins of all mankind. His physical life was, was taken from him. They thought they had succeeded, and can I say they were wrong? <laughs> they were wrong. When did he proclaim it? Third question. Well, there's differences of opinion here as well. Some claim that this uh, proclamation occurred only after the resurrection. Others believe it only happened when Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days later. Those could be possibilities, but based on what we've already seen and what we've concluded about Jesus' audience and the nature of what he said, it seems like it happened sometime between Jesus' death and resurrection. Peter specifically says that Jesus went in spirit to make this proclamation. Okay? Okay, so here's where we say all the great mysteries of Scripture. Right? Is that okay to say? That's okay to say. So it must have taken place after Jesus' spirit was made alive, but before the resurrection at which time his flesh was made alive at well, uh, as well. And so here's the thing about details. Even if we are not 100% correct on all of these details, the broad picture, the main point, is very apparent. Jesus suffered in the flesh. He turned the agony of defeat into the thrill of victory over all of his enemies. So when you look at this portion of scripture and you look at it within the context of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, this is huge. This is another narrative that explains all of this. The illustration of Noah in this passage confirms this idea. Remember Noah spent 120 years building this ark. As we saw, um, or as we will see, 2 Peter chapter 2, during that time Noah was the herald of righteousness. Noah and his family, in spite of the scorn, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the jeers, they kept on. They suffered ridicule and scorn for all of that time. But then when it rains and the fountains of the deep burst forth, what happens? Uh, Noah and his family are where? Safely in the ark. They are escaping the judgment of God, the ark, the instrument of God's salvation. The same floodwaters that destroyed the rest of mankind actually lifted the ark and Noah and his family to safety. Do you know what the best kind of boat is? The one that stays afloat. Think about that. I was watching a show here the other day and it was, it was a big cruiser, this real nice cruiser. And they were out in the Gulf, and all of a sudden they got a radio call, Mayday, Mayday, 
We're taking on water. Boy, it sure looked like a nice boat. They got over there. Uh, they had rescue ships that, that made good time getting there. And here they are. They are just doing everything they can to save this boat. And the guy said, man, this, this is my dream boat. I've, I love this boat. They couldn't save the boat. The only good boat is one that is floating. Turns out what had happened was uh, somebody had some valves in the wrong position. Now, what do I know about boats? I know that if your canoe has a plug, you better use a plug. I know that. But apparently these valves were in the wrong position and pretty soon they were taking on water and it was coming in so fast it couldn't be saved. I look at Noah. Following God's directions to a T. For Noah and his family, salvation was found in following God's plan to the leather and they were saved. It's often been said, experts built the Titanic. Amateurs built the ark. You can't debate that. Following God's plan, Noah's family was saved. And this brings us to verse 21, another difficult portion of the text. It says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Remember that. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so this verse has been taken out of context and used for a long time by different groups of people that will say, you are only saved if you are baptized. Okay? Uh, they, they will say that, and that's why we started the message again this morning by going over those four points. Right? How do you... How do you handle a tough text? So we see in 1 Peter and in Romans, the Bible consistently is clear that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Amen? That's salvation. Okay? Salvation does not save us at all. So with that in mind, why would Peter write here that baptism now saves you yeah, it would take a whole other message to go through all of that. But the word baptism, remember, is a transliteration of the underlying Greek word that means immersion. So the word has a far broader application here. Peter uses the word baptism in the same way that Paul used it here in this passage, Galatians chapter 3. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ... And so just to make sure there's no misunderstanding, uh, Peter writes that a person is saved by baptism, but look at what comes immediately after. Uh, this is where context, context, context means everything. There's a disclaimer here that he is not writing about a physical act in which dirt is removed from the flesh by water. It's not saying that at all. The way that baptism into Christ corresponds to Noah and his family is that they were preserved through the flood by placing their faith in God's provision of an ark. The same way we are saved by placing our faith in God's provision of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of that saving that we need. Noah and his family were saved through the water and not by the water, okay? Uh, they had the ark, they had God's provision. That is what is being talked about here. Baptism does not save us, but man, what a great picture that we find in the life of Noah. God's provision for saving Noah and his family came through simple obedience and building an ark and building it to the right specifications not listening to the crowds, not enduring all of the ridicule and the scorn. Can't you just hear them? What's rain? Noah says, well, it's going to rain. <laughs> yeah, what's that? 
Pretty soon, they find out. Of course, pretty soon it's 120 years. However, there comes a day where they find out. When I follow Jesus, he transforms my suffering in the flesh into triumph in the spirit. The importance of us keeping the main point the main point. Uh, the main point is this. Uh, we have a savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Okay. Big picture. We said we need to keep the big picture in mind as we're studying difficult texts. And it can be so easy to get bogged down in these things. Big picture. Uh, Jesus Christ died on a cross. Uh, he died once. He died for sin, my sin, not his. He took our place on the cross so that we could know God in a personal way. Can I say that is the big picture of this entire passage? Okay. So when we look at that and we understand what that means for us, for those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, the mandate and the model that we have in Scripture should be very clear how dare we keep this a secret? Uh, can I say the gospel should be the worst kept secret around? We should be sharing it with everybody. And just like in Noah's day, there will be some that will ridicule and that will scorn. How many of y'all have ever been called a clown because of, of sharing the gospel? I have. That's okay. That's fine. Here's what I know. I know at one point, you're, you have a decision to make. And if you don't make a decision for Jesus Christ, you have made your decision. I can't save anybody. I share the gospel. I share big picture, what Christ has done. What he has done for me, and if he's done it for me, he can do it for you. And that is, that is what we share. Loving Father God, we thank you for your word. It can be so easy, Lord, to get bogged down in so many of the details that, Lord, we lose sight of what all of these details point to. Father, I pray that we would look at your word. Father, that we would allow it to speak to us within the confines of Scripture. And as we do that, Father, I pray that we would be quick to share the good news of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.